Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning for our recurring team research forum. This morning, we have an outstanding panel of researchers who will talk to us about uh, reproductive health and reproductive rights. Uh, I want to start the session by acknowledging that each one of the speakers we have today could probably have their own two hour session and we would not have enough time to really explore their expertise and, and to learn from their wisdom. And I also want to acknowledge that there are a lot of other people at UC Davis who could also be part of the panel and contributing to the discussion. So I invite you to please be part of the conversation today by posting your comments and questions to the chat box. If you are aware of resources or events or anything else going on on campus in this topic and you would like to share it with the audience today, please feel free to also share those in the chat box. I'm going to remind everyone that we have a very large crowd today, so I'm asking you to please keep your microphones muted and your uh, video off. If you, for any reason, unmute or turn on your video, we have a couple of colleagues here from OR who are going to help you turn it off. So um, if you have questions again and comments, please submit it um, on the chat box. And with that, I won't take more time. I'm just going to do some brief introductions and we're going to spend the first 45 minutes to an hour getting some um, overarching remarks for, from each of our speakers, and then we're going to jump into the Q&A. So let me just do some brief introductions. Today we have Professor Mary Siegler, who has recently joined the UC Davis School of Law. Welcome. Um, she is an expert on the law, history, and politics of reproduction, healthcare, and conservatism in the United States from 1945 to the present. And she's one of the world's leading historians of the U.S. abortion debate. You can find a lot of her very recent writings um, in the New York Times and the Atlantic. Um, we also have Professor uh, Mitch Crane, who is the director of the Complex Family Planning Fellowship in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the UC, at the UC Davis Health. He is the former chair of that department, as well as the past president of the Society of Family Planning, and he has over 30 years of experience in abortion research and practice. We also have with us Professor Lisa Ikemoto. She is the Martin Luther King Jr. Professor of Law and specializes in teaching bioethics, healthcare, and public health law, reproductive rights, and justice. Her research areas include reproductive rights and justice, especially the ways that race, gender, disability, and wealth mediate access and impact biomedical technology and healthcare. We also have Professor Natalia Deeb Sosa, who is faculty in the Department of Chicano and Chicana Studies. Her research focuses on examining the effects of abortion restrictions on cross-border travel between Texas and Mexico. And today she's gonna to be joined also by a couple of her collaborators. We have Professor Thomas Strummer, who is the director of the Center for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence Research here at UC Davis. And his recent work is concerned with digital privacy and fairness in data science and artificial intelligence. He has ongoing NIH funded research with, together with um, physicians at UC Davis Health, looking at data privacy in healthcare. And finally, but not least, we have Jessica Pickney Hill, Jessica is the executive director of Access Reproductive Justice. It's an organization funding abortion and other reproductive health care. She oversees the organization's work to combine direct services, community education, and policy advocacy to promote real reproductive options and access to quality health care for people in California. So let's get started. I'm going to ask Professor Mary Siegler to help us open the conversation by talking to us a little bit, um, help us set the stage for today's conversation by sharing with us the broader historical implications of the passing and the overturn of Roe versus Wade, and what are the implications of this decision for other constitutionally protected rights? Yeah, thank you, um, Anna, for having me. And I'm really delighted, obviously, to be joining the Davis community. I think um, the, generally, if you're thinking about the history of how we got to Roe v. Wade, um, that's very much a history of how uh, the Supreme Court is part of a kind of broader dialogue about our rights, that Roe v. Wade didn't give us reproductive rights. Those rights were forged in dialogue with social movements, including movements with healthcare providers and family planning providers, 
um, and women and other pregnant people who had mobilized to demand access to this kind of care. Um, the story of how Roe v. Wade was reversed, I think, is definitely a story in part about um, not, it, it's certainly also a story of social movements. There's been an anti-abortion movement since before Roe was decided, and that movement was very active to get Roe reversed, first through trying to pass a federal personhood amendment that would have criminalized abortion in California as well as in places like Alabama, and subsequently in trying to control the Supreme Court. But that history, I think, um, implicates other constitutional rights in more ways than one. Um, some of the more obvious ways involve access to contraception because the definition of abortion within the anti-abortion movement has always been contested. We see that happening even recently. Um, yesterday, uh, some of you have, may have been following the story of a 10-year-old girl who was a victim of rape who crossed state lines to get an abortion in Indiana. Leading anti-abortion groups said simply, this isn't an abortion. Um, so this playing around with what is or is not abortion has been done for a long time in the context of emergency contraceptives, IUDs and the like, which means that states banning abortion may be sweeping in those devices as, or um, techniques of family planning as well. Uh, but I think other rights are at stake as well, because it's quite clear that the anti-abortion movement understood that, um, one, it would be impossible through ordinary democratic politics to get a nationwide ban on abortion, which is the movement's goal. And two, that to get closer to that step, you would need something like fundamental change to our democratic institutions, whether that's the degree to which the Supreme Court is responsive to popular opinion, whether that's um, the degree to which Supreme Court justices were nominated to kind of rile up a small minority of voters rather than to gain bipartisan consensus in the Senate, whether that's how the Republican Party functions in terms of catering to the median voter rather than to catering to the base. So the changes it took, I think, to get Roe v. Wade were fundamental changes to how the Republican Party operates, even though certainly the Republican Party has sort of had dog whistles about race and a variety of other things before. The Republican Party of 2022 is different in salient ways from what came before. Um, the Supreme Court of 2022 feels almost unrecognizable, even though we've known the court is a political institution, the pace of change the court is setting, and the degree to which it's completely indifferent to the voices of critics, um, I think is unprecedented. And all of that is by design. So that's a way of saying that um, the effort to ban abortion has always been an effort to kind of erode democracy in salient ways, and we see that unfolding. Um, and then probably the other obvious way is that the arguments raised against Roe v. Wade, um, and Lisa may touch on this too, were arguments that could be raised against any number of what lawyers call substantive due process rights, which is to say, you know, rights to use birth control, rights to marry, rights to marriage equality, rights to interracial marriage, rights to parent, rights to um, avoid forced uh, like sterilization abuse and other forms of forced um, avoidance of reproduction. The foundation of all of those rights was a kind of broadly conceived right of autonomy or privacy. And the reasons the Supreme Court rejected such a right when it came to abortion in the Dobbs case was simply that the court said that at the relevant time of history, which for this court was the late 19th century, no one would have recognized a right to abortion because states criminalized abortion or were criminalizing abortion throughout pregnancy at that time. There's a whole separate conversation about how that history that I just recounted to you is wrong, but just tabling that for now, the premise is that if states were criminalizing something or had criminalized something in the 19th century, it isn't a right. So um, at least 22 states were still criminalizing interracial marriage um, in the late 19th century. Uh, in, 18, in the 1870s, a period the court finds relevant, Congress criminalized the mailing of birth control. Um, dozens of states were doing the same thing. Obviously, um, oral and anal sex, same-sex intimacy broadly defined, was criminalized in the 19th century and was just beginning to be applied specifically to LGBTIQ people as opposed to just broadly to anyone having what was considered um, the act against nature, as they put it. So if that's our metric for what kinds of constitutional rights we have, many other constitutional rights are at risk. And I would emphasize, so too is abortion access in California, whether that's through states trying to prevent interstate travel, trying to punish corporations like Lyft that reimburse out-of-state employees for travel to places like California for abortion, whether that's through Congress passing a federal ban on abortion that would preempt California state law, even California state constitutional law on abortion, or whether uh, that's through the anti-abortion movement returning to this super conservative Supreme Court 
that isn't bound by conventional legitimacy constraints and essentially asking the court to hold that a fetus is a rights holding person and that states like California are unable to pass laws um, expanding access to reproductive health choice and justice. So um, that's kind of where we are, but I think the simplest story is that obviously while this is a story about healthcare and this is a story about the rights of pregnant people and the rights of women, it's also a story about, about democracy. And there's very close and obvious ties between the anti-abortion movement and the movement to deregulate campaign spending, the anti-abortion movement and the effort to overturn the 2020 election, the anti-abortion movement and the effort to restrict access to voting, um, including mail-in voting across the country. So um, this is a story as much about democracy as it is about reproductive justice, and you can't easily separate the two. I'll stop there. Thank you, Professor Siegler. So another aspect um, of this uh, conversation is the immediate impact. We, we are very aware of the immediate impacts of, of the overturn, which is certain people in certain stages in certain states cannot um, access abortions. But what does the research tell us about the longer term impacts on overall health and well-being of people denied abortions? And um, this question is for uh, Professor Cranin. Can you also tell us a little bit about how this is affecting physicians in their actual practice and their plans to do research in, in healthcare? Um, certainly, let me, I actually, to try to keep everybody um, going in a, what's gonna be a potentially a long couple hours, I prepared a few slides um, just to, uh, just let me see if I can get them pulled up here a second. Thank you for your patience. And everybody should see this title slide. Good. Um, so thank you for including me. I'm gonna go through a little bit about uh, the Supreme Court and research and facts, and just to help keep things in perspective. Um, let me make sure this works. We go. Um, so the first fact uh, that we want to go through is that most Republican legislators and some Democratic legislators don't really care about facts. Um, and I think that's something that's important for all of us to understand um, as they relate to abortion. Um, and here's some of the irony that kind of shows this uh, lack of caring about any of the work that we do. And, and unfortunately, it's really kind of where we the Supreme Court is kind of, as it currently stands, has shifted this uh, belief in facts and research. So mifepristone and misoprostol medical abortion has been studied in millions of study participants and patients, publications with hundreds of thousands of people uh, totaling, like I said, from all over the world, totaling over um, a million study participants with lots of facts and lots of consistency of data. And we know details of this treatment that it's very safe, very effective, and we know the difference in efficacy by gestational age, who's at risk when they, to use this treatment, so who are um, patients that it's reasonable to offer this to and, and those who could be harmed due to underlying medical issues, uh, the proportion that experience side effects or complications, uh, including you know how often people need to go to the ER when they use this treatment, anything that you can think of, we know about this treatment. So this, despite knowing all of this, you have Republican legislators who want to limit access to this quote unquote, dangerous treatment. Um, they will call it chemical abortion to give it a different term to imply differences in safety, trying to get away from the terms medical or medication, which, am, which uh, are the commonly used medical terms. The irony here is let's look at a, uh, something that's promoted by uh, very conservative groups, uh, mifepristone reversal or medical abortion reversal, which has been only studied in a few patients. There are two case series which one has six patients and one has three patients and one randomized placebo controlled study, uh, which was conducted at UC Davis. That's it for research, right? We have a total of 21 participants in studies, keeping in mind that two of those were case series, the lowest level of evidence that really comprise any evidence. There is a third report that had 547 patients uh, with 325 providers that was reported in, I'll just say a non-reputable 
a medical journal that doesn't meet the criteria for a case series, that the low level criteria for the lowest level of medical evidence. So we don't really, that can't count as a study. So all we have really are 21 people in any kinds of studies. We don't know the details of this treatment of, as far as efficacy by gestational age, who's at risk to use this treatment, the proportion experience, side effects or complications, ER visit rates with use, and all those kind of things that we would want to know. Um, yet there are laws in eight states that require patients be informed of this medical treatment, and there are currently 12 states pending uh, bills uh, that are um, energized by the recent Supreme Court decision. So you can see that here we have medical facts uh, well-studied treatments um, that are being attacked, whereas those that have virtually no proof of evidence and no proof of safety that are being put into law. The second research fact to look at is that the current majority of the U.S. Supreme Court doesn't really care about facts as they relate to abortion. We kind of understand that. Uh, trying to get the idea that women who are turned away from abortion really create a better society. And I think all of us understand that's hogwash. Um, and let's look at the facts. Our colleagues at UCSF and uh, the answer team uh, also based in the, uh, at UCSF uh, did an amazing study over three years where they recruited patients from 30 abortion facilities around the country, interviewed nearly a thousand patients that were seeking abortion, realizing that understanding that some of the people in the cohort had received abortions and some were turned away from receiving an abortion. It all had to do with the gestational age they were at the time they presented. Um, again, these were at 30 different facilities around the country. So each area had different limits on gestational age. So whereas in California, somebody could present at 21 weeks for an abortion and receive her abortion, there, were, there are states where at 21 weeks, she no longer can access an abortion. So these were patients who were turned away. Uh, some of these, patients were able to go elsewhere, but the majority of them carried the term. Uh, and they interviewed the participants in the study every six months over five years, conducting nearly 8,000 interviews. So we have so much data on what happens to people who have their desired abortion compared to those who were turned away or unable to have their desired abortion. So again, we could go, as mentioned earlier, we could go over this for hours, just the, the findings from this incredible project. So. I'm going to try to hit a couple of highlights uh, to spur in the conversation. Uh, first, why do people have abortions, right? Uh, and the most common reasons are not being able to afford a child, the pregnancy comes at the wrong time in that person's life, um, or the man involved is not suitable uh, to that person to be a co-parent. Um, and keep in mind that with uh, not only just in uh, bad relationships, but in rape, laws that limit the ability to seek abortion, I mean, that person is going to be involved in the uh, pregnant person's life for the rest of their life because that child will be uh, the, the um, person that binds the two. But what are not common reasons as people try to allude to? Alcohol, tobacco, and drug use actually are not common reasons. Uh, those who on the conservative side who say it's really just about uh, those bad players who get abortions, that's not right. And interesting, the patients who, the small percentage of people who say it's because of alcohol, tobacco, or drugs don't otherwise have wanted pregnancy. So it's not like that's the reason. They're, otherwise, they would want to continue the pregnancy. Um, the other key findings are who has later abortions, right? Who are those bad people that wait to have an abortion? They're those are not bad people. They live in a different world than lots of us. Keep in mind that 90% of abortions occur at uh, the first trimester under 12 weeks. Um, so that as gestation advances, you have fewer and fewer abortions. Less than 1% of abortions in the United States occur at more than 20 weeks. Typically, people have later abortions are those who didn't realize they were pregnant, or more importantly, who are slowed down by logistical barriers. So all these rules and laws that go into place actually delay abortion when um, Laws went into place in the South uh, that limited the ability of teens to access abortion. They had to have parental consent. The primary outcome of that, those laws that was demonstrated was that teens had abortions at a later gestational age than they had previously. Um, we know that young women and women who have never had a child before are at higher risk of not recognizing their pregnancy in the first trimester. So those younger people are at higher risk. So when you start to limit access, it has an untoward effect more on younger people. 
And even before 20 week bans started to show up in our country, there were more than 4,000 women per, per year who were denied wanted abortions due to gestational age limits. So as we impose more limits, obviously we're gonna see more people um, not being able to access their abortion. So what are patients' experiences? There are lots of conservatives that say abortion is harmful, it's traumatizing. Well, first, when you talk to patients who go through this process, it's rare for patients to feel pressured by counseling. Counseling is, uh, patients feel that counseling is less helpful when it's state mandated. Um, so this is out of the patient's mouths, not out of the legislator's mouth. Many want to view an ultrasound examination. They don't feel it's something that's intrusive, but having, so having that ability to do so is important, but it doesn't sway them one way or the other. About half reported protesters at their clinics and that more protest or contact only worked to make the patients upset, but did not change how they feel about their abortion. So this idea of sidewalk counseling is necessary. All it does is inflame people, but doesn't change the outcome. Um, patients though do note a substantial burden in trying to raise funds to pay for an abortion uh, in states where there is no support. And all this results in is delay and creates more patients with later abortions. So putting up barriers uh, up until the recent Supreme Court ruling really just created more later abortions. Um, now, when patients are followed over this five years, obviously the conservatives want you to think that people changed their minds, that this was a horrible thing for them to do. Well, uh, more than 95% feel it was the right decision still five years later. Um, I would try to ask you for anything where the majority of people are a rate that high would still feel it was a right decision, whether you talk about car buying or house buying or taking a job or anything. So greater than 95% is a really high rate. Um, and importantly, by following these people, we can see not only the how they feel about things over time, over a five-year period, but the financial implications. So for those patients who were denied an abortion, um, and when you look at their uh, credit reports in the, or when you look at patients' credit reports in the three years prior, you could compare the patients who received and denied abortions in the study, and they had pretty uh, similar uh, financial status going into the study. But when you follow those, follow them out over five years, what you found is that the trajectories then diverged based on whether they were able to get their abortion or not get their desired abortion. And those who were denied um, getting, having the, their desired abortion had more debt, lower credit scores, and worse financial security, and about a four times increased odds that their household income would fall below the poverty level. So restricting abortion drives more families into poverty. Very clear data. Um, over the five years, patients who were denied abortions I recorded more chronic pain, uh, overall health was worse, and two of the patients who were done in abortions died during childbirth. And obviously uh, the risk of death during an abortion is significantly lower. In fact, it's 25 times lower than childbirth, All right? So the key findings were that patients who received a wanted abortion were more financially stable, they were able to set more ambitious goals, raise children under more stable conditions in the future, and more likely to have a wanted child later. So I didn't go through all of that data, but these were really the key findings. So keeping in mind that we have data, the unfortunate thing about provision of abortion services and research about abortion services is that we now live in a legal climate where the ultimate beholder of uh, laws, the Supreme Court has said, none of our data matters. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't continue this research because there are many places around the country where abortion is legal. We still need to ensure that we're providing the best care and the best information to patients. Um, and we need to figure out then maybe new strategies for developing more the type of facts that potentially can be used to help uh, write uh, laws that would be supportive of women and their families. Thank you, Professor Craning. I, I made a note that because it's a shocking fact that abortion is 25 times um, lower mortality than childbirth. It's, it's shameful, truly. So, so in order to address a lot of these um, issues that you listed, we need a very robust, strong research um, activity. Um, and I want to bring in Professor Lisa Ikemoto right now. Um, to talk to us a little bit how abortion bans and other laws in abortion host, hostile states have raised concerns about 
how they can affect healthcare and biomedical research. So we, we want to have like maybe a little discussion around what are those potential implications of abortion bans on healthcare and, and mostly on healthcare research, which we are um, a research enterprise here at UC Davis. Sure, thanks. I'm glad to be here today um, talking with everyone. I'm gonna start with sort of maybe the most obvious question. Mary Ziegler already flagged this and that's about sort of what about the implications more for um, other aspects of reproductive health. So I'll, I'll just use examples throughout my um, remarks. So contraception access is certainly on the table. And I think for three reasons. Um, the most immediate one perhaps is that as <laughs> the clinics close, contraception access is also um, limited. So the clinics that are closing provide a much broader array of services in most cases um, than abortion itself. Um, and many people obtain contraception through those same clinics. They provide a full array of family planning services and contraception is one of the most common form of family planning healthcare services. The second way that contraception access is in jeopardy is that as Mary mentioned, the court signaled um, that the abortion right or right of access to abortion is different than the other privacy rights, but it also signaled that maybe it's not so different from the others. Um, in important ways. And certainly Justice Thomas's opinion um, said, stated outright um, that he was ready to revisit other privacy rights, including um, the right of access to contraception. So it might be that the court itself is prepared, particularly with respect to IUDs and to emergency contraception. The court's already sort of validated the idea or the belief that those are abortive patients in its decision about Hobby Lobby, which was based on religious belief. Um, but the court was willing to go with that without, as Mitch indicated, sort of looking at the facts. Um, and then I think the third way that contraception access might be at um, risk is um, just the sort of part of this sort of slippery slope um, that we're on towards eroding, um, I think, autonomy. Um, more generally. Um, and so um, I'll just leave that there. And then I guess the point I'd like to say about the rest of healthcare is that, um, or at least my starting point is that um, the understanding of comprehensive care is being substantially limited in the states that are either substantially restricting or banning abortion. And it does so based on gender and gender identity and in a way that impacts and will re exacerbate um, racial disparities in healthcare. So the states with the highest maternal um, um, maternal mortality rates um, have or are likely to ban abortion. The burdens fall heaviest on black women and other pregnant people of color in those st states. And it's likely that abortion bans will increase um, maternal mortality rates as well. Um, a lot of what I, sort of the legal part of this is that a lot of what I'm going to say really arises from the uncertainty um, that's being created by these abortion bans and how they might apply. Um, so, for example, they arise in some cases because the abortion bans are poorly written. So just to give you an example, the Louisiana ban has an exception to preserve the life of the mother. And that's a quote. That exception only applies in the case of a quote unquote medical emergency. The statute has a definition of a medical emergency, but not in a way that assures providers that they will be free from um, prosecution if, for example, they provide um, full scope miscarriage care um, or other, other um, forms of care in the case of whatever the medical emergency is. Those laws are being right now challenged for vagueness um, so those are the legal changes, but we don't know what's going to happen, which means the uncertainty continues. And I think that's in part the purpose um, of having that sort of broad, unclear language. And then the, I think the other types of questions that are being raised right now are created not just by sort of the uncertainty in the language of the abortion bans and restrictions, but just this sort of general air of um, abortion hostility uh, that's being fostered. Um, throughout the United States right now. So that could affect prenatal care, miscarriage care. There's been a lot of news coverage about that. Hesitation by doctors about when they can and can't 
um, provide, for example, a DNC to uh, for somebody who shows up in the emergency room because they're experiencing um, a miscarriage. Um, and then more broadly, some of these, the sort of abortion hostility or some of the vague language in the abortion statutes also creates a lot of uncertainty for providers in caring for almost any kind of patient, um, not just one who's seeking um, abortion services, for example. So it might be that a doctor who's an oncologist has a patient who's been diagnosed with cancer, but that person is pregnant. Um, is it legal still? Um, or is that person liable for malpractice or for violating an abortion law if they counsel the person about abortion as a possible um, therapeutic option? Is it um, appropriate for them to provide them with treatment that might put the pregnancy at risk? Um, all those kinds of questions are being put on the table right now. Um, some of the FDA approved drugs that are associated with abortion, for example, um, either treatment of ectopic pregnancy or medication abortion have other therapeutic uses. Um, so for example, methotrexate, there were some stories in the news about this yesterday. It's used to treat rheumatoid arthritis, um, other autoimmune conditions, cancer, um, and ectopic pregnancy as well. Um, and because of the concerns in the states with abortion bans, doctors are withholding the use or pharmacists are afraid to fill, fill, fill prescriptions for methotrexate for people with autoimmune conditions um, because they're afraid it'll get flagged as an abortion um, procedure. And I could go on with the other drugs as well. Um, Anna asked me to talk about assisted reproductive technology use. So this comes up in two ways um, or the issues come up in two ways. So one is one of the most common forms of assisted reproductive technologies is in vitro fertilization. Um, and those use in vitro embryos, typically six to 10 cell um, embryos. Um, some of the abortion bans, many of the abortion bans include a definition of life or person that begins at fertilization. So they state that life or person is defined with respect to fertilization. And the question is, does that apply to ex vivo embryos um, as well? Arizona, actually, the legislature actually passed a statute that declares that life begins at fertilization and it's not an abortion ban, indicating that it would apply directly to in vitro fertilization. That, uh, bill, that law, recently enacted law, has been blocked uh, but we don't know what its future will be. Um, the other way that assisted reproductive technology uh, use might be compromised is with respect to surrogacy. So if you have somebody who's providing surrogacy services for another individual or couple, um, sometimes uh, because of health risks or other reasons, um, an abortion is sought, abortion services are sought. And if you're in a state providing surrogacy services for somebody with a ban, with an abortion ban, then you no longer have that option, um, at least not in that particular jurisdiction. So all of these take place in the context of um, healthcare disparities. And we saw during the past, we've seen during the past two years um, that um, structural racism and other forms of inequality certainly um, affect sort of um, who is most at risk? Um, and all those same factors play into um, uh, maternal care as well or prenatal care as well. So um, in my last minute or so, um, I'm gonna mention three examples of how clinical research or um, biomedical research might also um, be put at risk or limited because of uncertainties about how these laws affect that research. So the first one is clinical research. And we've certainly seen in the past two years that inclusion of pregnant women in clinical trials, drug trials, for example, is critical. They could not have, the researchers could not have determined that the vaccines were safe and essential um, for treating pregnant women with COVID um, or at risk um, of COVID, for example. Um, they could not have determined that the therapies that were developed for um, treating pregnant women or pregnant people with um, COVID um, without the inclusion of pregnant women in those clinical trials. And it, um, it may now be that researchers are hesitant to include, more hesitant than they have been in the past, to include 
um, pregnant people in clinical trials um, because of the concern that the risks of what's being tried to the pregnancy might result in some sort of prosecution or other legal liability. Um, the second example I'll give is research to improve knowledge of menstruation and pregnancy outcomes. I was contacted by a researcher in another state that's likely to um, um, enact an abortion ban about they're doing uh, work on um, menstrual cycles and their, their subjects or participants in the clinic in the trial are using menstrual cycle tracking apps. Um, and now the advice, of course, is if you live in a state with an abortion ban, you should get off those apps and protect your digital privacy. And maybe Dr. Stromer can address this. But they're concerned about sort of what's their responsibility in protecting the subjects and are they placing people at risk by having them use those apps to begin with. Um, and then the other part of it is the third example I'll give is um, different types of biomedical research used in vitro embryos. So fertility research itself, research to improve the um, success rates or reduce the failure rates of in vitro fertilization. Some of that uses in vitro embryos and results in the destruction of the in vitro embryos. Human embryonic stem cell research, which raised a great deal of anti-abortion animus um, during the first decade of um, the century, um, also uses in vitro embryos. And there are other examples as well but I will end on the note that abortion research um, itself um, is also in jeopardy. And that's a very vital form of um, health research. Um, and it's much more difficult to, difficult to conduct if people are afraid um, to accurately report um, their menstrual cycles, whether or not they've undergone an abortion, whether or not they're likely to, what they think about it. Um, so that is also put at jeopardy. So I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. It gives us a lot to think about. Um, what, what we do in the United States for abortion and health rights sometimes is mimicked or used uh, to, to guide policies in our neighboring countries too, or to inspire action. And so next I want to ask uh, Professor Natalia Deeb Sosa and her colleagues to talk to, to us about her work, their work in Mexico, um, they have been, um, they're a community engaged in this interdisciplinary team that is exploring how to work together with other feminist groups to successfully um, decriminalize abortion in Mexico. And we want to hear from you about what are some of the important lessons uh, that the pro-choice and reproductive justice movements in the U.S. can use from your experience in working with communities across the border. Thank you uh, very much. So uh, we prepared a PowerPoint and I would like to share. Can people see it? Yep, okay, great. So uh, I'm Natalia Deep Sosa. I'm a professor in Chicano Chicana Studies and I have had the honor of working with uh, Dr. Deborah Billings and also with Veronica Cruz from Las Libres. And I'm going to, um, I was, I'm going to try to put what I have on my notes that are the websites of these three uh, powerful women. If, okay, there it is. Uh, now I'm going to try to go to the next one. I'm not very good with techno, technology or Zoom, so please forgive me. So uh, our research objectives uh, have been to examine the framing and the strategies used by uh, activists, feminist activists in Mexico and how they have supported women in the US and Mexico to end unwanted pregnancies. Also how uh, we can understand how they articulate uh, sexual and reproductive rights movements. And third, to explore the different strategies that they have done to make sure that those who are most marginalized, that include indigenous Afro-descendants are included in this reproductive, uh, uh, in this, uh, reproductive rights movement. So for those of you who are not uh, aware of what has been going on in Mexico, they have 
gone completely in a different route than what the US has gone. Uh, so Mexico Supreme Court in September 2021 unanimously voted uh, that criminalizing abortion is unconstitutional and that decision was based in human rights language saying that the right to human dignity, autonomy, and equality was important. Uh, the ruling uh, started uh, with Mexico City and, and um, that was in 2007. Uh, and in 2019 was Oaxaca, and that was followed uh, with really the organization of the Green Wave and feminist movements. Uh, in 2021 was uh, the Mexican states of Hidalgo and Veracruz. And uh, as of June 2022, uh, abortion is available on request to any woman up to 12 weeks of pregnancy in the states of Colima, Baja California, Sinaloa, Guerrero, and Baja California Sur. Hi, I'm gonna take it from here and talk a little bit about um, one of the strategies that's been used since the early 2000s, been actually developed out of Mexico through the organization Las Libres. And that is the strategy of accompaniment. Just to contextualize briefly, Las Libres was based out or continues to be based out of Guanajuato, Mexico, which is one of the most conservative states. And this whole strategy was developed before any sort of legislative um, change took place in Mexico starting in 2007. And the important thing about accompaniment and I'm not going to read this whole quote from Veronica Cruz, but that to highlight that the accompaniment movement was built themselves by primarily women, feminist activists who are not physicians, they're not medical providers. They educated themselves about how to use misoprostol safely. The difference between Mexico and here is you can get misoprostol over the counter in Mexico and in many other countries. And so this group began by saying, well, we can access the medication. We're going to learn how to inform women how to use it safely to interrupt their pregnancies. And we'll have backup by medical providers in the case of any um, you know, uh, difficult situations. So that's one piece of it um, that women, that this, this sort of movement built spaces between women so that women could live out their rights. And that really has been at the core, at the foundation of the accompaniment movement. Um, that, you know, we've taken from the state, we hear what they have to say, they say, but we are the ones that say whether it's legal or not in a very restrictive setting. And they have defended women, and we're gonna show you some numbers in a second. Um, and that it really is the decision of the women and that in any case, we're going to take those rights that correspond to us and we're going to fight. And although it's restrictive, it's publicly known that women are accessing abortion through the accompaniment networks. And what they have succeeded in doing, and we'll look at some of the numbers, is eliminating health risks associated with unsafe abortion. Um, and also addressing, this is at one of the core pieces of decriminalizing abortion in Mexico. Okay, so we're gonna go to the next slide. This is um, a video, a documentary that we made around 2014 that talks about accompaniment. And we're just gonna show a, like a two and a half minute clip here. Pues te abre el tema, ¿no? O sea, te abre el tema, o sea, por total, porque no, no, no eres juzgada, ¿no? No es como, ¿y por qué lo hiciste? ¿Y cuándo pasó? ¿Y cuántas veces lo has hecho? ¿Y cuántas parejas sexuales has tenido? O sea, eso es y totalmente, en la red es totalmente irrelevante, ¿no? O sea, no, no te preguntan, ¿otra vez? No, o sea, para nada, ¿no? Eso es un tema 
bastante abierto. O sea, sí, el simple hecho de que tú puedas estar con otra mujer hablando del tema, ya es, ya es ganancia, ¿no? Hacerlo en un café, que es así casi un escándalo. Las bla, aborto. aborto. No, o sea, es escandaloso, es escandaloso. Pero es, es ellas, o sea, verlas como con ese compromiso, esa seguridad, esas herramientas para acompañar a las mujeres, ver cómo las mujeres dicen claro que acompaño, esta insistencia que les hacemos de si tú, y, er, y que era algo que tú nos decías, ¿no? O sea, por eso es una red de acompañamiento, porque si tú accediste a este derecho, cualquier otra mujer puede hacerlo. Entonces sí, el papel que ellas jugaron pues era nuevamente de apoyo, de saber que están ahí, que no hay juicio, que son un apoyo total, íntegro, y pues que uno tiene que tomar la, la responsabilidad para el, elegir. ¿no? Últimos que será cinco o seis años, casi todas las mujeres llegan con su pareja. Y eso nos parece maravilloso porque se nota cómo los hombres se han ido responsabilizando, se han ido involucrando, les ha caído el 20, pero también eh, vienen acompañadas por sus familias, por papás, mamás, abuelitas, tíos. Y eso nos parece porque no es un problema de las mujeres, es una situación social que tenemos que ir desmitificando. Es como esto también nosotras mismas vamos aprendiendo sobre esas situaciones y lo interesante es como ya no a nivel de organizaciones, sino ya a nivel de, de estados este, y cómo se va entretejiendo una red como a nivel nacional, ¿no? Y otra cosa que hemos visto es que los primeros años las mujeres llegaban en el límite que podían hacerse el aborto a las nueve semanas, a las doce semanas. Sí, o sea, como ya, ¿qué hago? ¡Ay, esto! Ya no, ya no, o sea, como el último... último y porque último, no sabían a dónde ir, ¿no? Suponemos, y ahora como se ha masificado la información y se ha pasado más de boca en boca, ha sido maravilloso como las mujeres ya llegan en las primeras semanas, cuatro, cinco, seis semanas, y eso está muy bien porque es mucho más efectivo. Para mí es una gran satisfacción. Para mí el decir, ya he acompañado a... 100 mujeres o más, o me llaman a mi teléfono en el particular o el celular de la red, para mí me da mucha satisfacción. Me encanta que siempre salga alguien y pregunte, ¿verdad que las libres acompañan a las mujeres para el acceso a un aborto y yo? So, um, that video that documentary is available to everyone it's on youtube and if you don't have the link already we can share that again so we made that documentary to really show not show so that the the people themselves involved in accompaniment both receiving it and providing it could speak for themselves and there's a lot more detail in that documentary so where has this taken um sort of the movement right In 22 years in Mexico, this network has helped around 15,000 women have safe abortions. There's not a single woman that's died. If there's any complication, it's an incomplete abortion that colleagues who are trained OBGYNs, for example, in solidarity, they provide safe services to complete that abortion. Um, in the past few months, This network has already helped 1,500 women here in the United States. And one of the things that we want to kind of bring to the discussion is how it should not and cannot be the responsibility of Mexican advocates or activists and our you know, fellow advocates around the world to take responsibility for the networks that we need to build here in the United States. We have a lot to learn, the answers, quite honestly, are not here. They are elsewhere. And we need to learn from our um, fellow activists who have made so many strides throughout the world and right here in Latin America. So I will pass it back to Dr. Deep Sosa. Thank you. So what are our next steps? Uh, we're gonna continue doing interviews as uh, Dr. Debbie Billings said, We, we must continue learning from the 20 plus years of collective organizing and accompaniment from Mexico. We have to, there's an enormous uh, gap between the law and reality, as well as serious human rights violations. 
from religious uh, fanaticism, and we want to document that. We have to continue applying for grants. Uh, it's difficult to fund this kind of work, and most of that money needs to go to the people on the ground doing this work, risking, uh, you know, their their liberty, and and really we need to be conscious of that. And we need to start organizing here to make sure that we are the ones who organize to do that. So, um, yeah, and we want to end by thanking you all for taking the time to, uh, to uh, learn about this important topic. So thank you. Thank you, Natalia and Debbie. So throughout the last uh, presentations, we've heard on multiple times about um, social media online platforms. Uh, Professor Ikamoto mentioned um, apps to track menstruation. So I, I want to um, give an opportunity to Professor S Thomas Strommer to talk to us a little bit about his work. Um, in the, the immediate aftermath of the, of the um, Supreme Court decision, a lot of us use social media to either find information or post our opinions. A lot of us use tracking apps. Um, so I would like to hear from you to talk to us a little bit about what your research has um, shown regarding the implications um, for individuals searching for abortion access, for example, or um, how we manage our medical information. What, what are the implications for data privacy? Thank you for having me. Uh, before diving right into privacy, let me say a few words about the Center for Data Science and AI Research, or CEDA for short. Uh, we are, in essence, the hub for anything related to data science and AI at UC Davis. And our mission is really to take on these grand challenges of society where data science and AI can play an important role. Uh, you see the key topics of research listed here. And the two highlighted in blue are the ones that are relevant for today. One is health and medicine, and the other one is foundations, method, and tools. And under this last uh, foundations, method, and tools, this is which are, this contains also our work on digital privacy. Uh, as we have heard, uh, privacy is under attack, and it's really uh, under attack from two different angles. First, I should say that privacy is not just some luxury, but it's really a fundamental human right, uh, going back, uh, you know, hundreds of years, but at least to the 1948 when the United Nations included human rights as a basic human right, uh, included privacy as a basic human right. All right now, there are two uh, angles of attack. One is overturning Roe versus Wade. We all know about that. And the other direction where privacy is under threat is surveillance capitalism. So let me say a few words about surveillance capitalism before coming back to uh, how this all ties into abortion-related issues. Uh, surveillance capitalism is a term coined by Shoshana Zuboff, and it's really this new economic system that we're facing, where companies like Google, Facebook, Amazon, and so on are monitoring and also shaping our daily lives with their surveillance technology, uh, be it a simple Google search, be it a simple app on your cell phone, and they monitor our daily lives to an astonishing detail and exploit it for their own benefits via advertising or other uh, money-making uh, mechanisms, and it's really built in into the business models. Uh, unfortunately, this really has impacted our life in the way how we communicate, or maybe should not communi communicate anymore, how our rights are impacted, and it really goes to the point that it has disastrous consequences for democracy and freedom. Uh, the last elections in the US being a few examples how this could impact really uh, our daily lives in massive ways. And this brings us to what I would call abortion surveillance. There are many, many ways, unfortunately, how women seeking abortion or just seeking information about abortion uh, can be tracked digitally. And here, I'll just list a few of them. So let's say you live in Texas and you drive to a, st a state that provides abortion. Uh, you could be tracked via your, you know, with, via license plate cameras or via fast lane uh, cameras. You could be, you know, if you rent this or a rental car, uh, this rental car has GPS built in. So there are many ways that would how to track your emotions and you move from one state to another. 
But also when you don't leave your state, you will be tracked by your internet searches. For example, you look for something related to abortion uh, in your internet search, then this will be something that recorded by Google or uh, other companies. Uh, and you have really no option if you use those tools to avoid it. Uh, your deliveries, uh, your orders and deliveries of abortion pills can easily be tracked. Uh, if you have conversations with your friends and you sit in front of an so-called virtual assistant, Alexa, Echo, you need to be aware that your conversations are constantly recorded and transmitted to Amazon and so on. So this is not something you choose that's constantly happening. So just turn off that machine, uh, otherwise it will always be uh, end up in the hands of, of Amazon and other companies. Most of our emails, text messages and social media posts will uh, constantly be uh, surveilled by companies. So this is something, uh, it's very easy to track in that way. And we, all had a, we heard a lot about uh, period trackers, period trackers, uh, all the data that you collect there are easily accessible by companies. And that means also by uh, law enforcement and bounty hunters. But there's a little bit more at stake here and not everything is targeted towards people uh, looking for abortion, but sometimes uh, companies target people trying to get pregnant, but as a side effect, it makes it easy to target people looking for abortions. And the issue here is that new parents are really the holy grail of retailers. And there's good reasons for that. New parents buy a lot of new products they haven't bought before, diapers, wipes, and so on. Uh, so this is a huge market. New parents are tired, they don't have much time, uh, you know, they're excited about the baby, so they are sometimes or quite often price insensitive. They want to buy something quickly, they don't have the time to think about, they may be excited, so they spend a lot of money. And they, because of their time issue, they like to buy everything in one place if possible, which is really great for retailers. So if I get access to new parents, I get a lot of um, money in the future. This is also the problem, right? Uh, you need to grab those new parents early on because there's a lot of competition with other retailers, which means you need to grab those new parents when the women get pregnant as soon as possible. And then you lock them in into your brand. And this is where the problem lies in connection to abortion. Uh, companies try to surveil and monitor pregnant women as early as possible. And as a side effect, that means, of course, uh, it would also monitor if people try to end on a portion. And I should say that the culprits here in all this Roe versus Wade discussion are not just the religious fanatics and the anti-abortion bounty hunters, but it's really also the whole tech industry. Uh, in particular, companies like Google, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, uh, they are really a part of this dangerous equation that we're facing right now. One should say there's no law that does require Google, Google to collect all the data about us. They don't, they don't have to. They want to do this. It's part of the business model. So this surveillance that we are facing constantly is part of the business model deeply ingrained into, in companies like Google and Facebook. This is how they make a lot of money. So this is why they will keep it up. All the talk of, of Google, well, if you uh, live in a state which doesn't really offer abortion, you can move to another state if you work for us. Uh, that's kind of a very minor thing, right? The really deep damage, the major damage is done in the way Google is surveilling us and therefore, and also selling this, this data. And selling this data is possible. So for example, a journalist was able to buy hundreds and hundreds of hours of uh, phone conversations and uh, location data uh, from data brokers that collected this from uh, Planned Parenthood locations. So these data are out there, you can buy them. And this makes it of course very dangerous because it means all these bounty hunters now given this Texas law, uh, the new Texas law, they can access those data. And that makes it really, really dangerous. And of course, law enforcement can access those too. Now, California has a fairly strong privacy law, but it's really very, it's really the, the exception. Most states do not have good privacy laws. 
and uh, how to Google and correct to this? Well, they don't like California's strong privacy law. So Google is now advocating for a so-called privacy law, a federal privacy law, uh, because it pretends to want to send privacy standards. What it really tries to do is it tries to weaken the California privacy law by implementing a very weak federal privacy law, which really doesn't give you any privacy at all. So the problem is here is we cannot trust, you know, the big players in tech with our privacy. That's similar to trusting uh, oil companies with the environment, right? And that really didn't work out very well. So we cannot trust tech companies when they say they protect our privacy. It's just not happening. And time and again, uh, they violate the privacy laws and then have to pay billions of dollars of fines and keep doing it. So this is really not the solution. But what about the medical data? Is there a difference? Well, there are the so-called so HIPAA, HIPAA uh, privacy rules that try to establish some standards how you protect your uh, medical records. And in a way, they do that. But on the other hand, HIPAA also therefore provides a mechanism how to share your uh, uh, medical data and how this medical data of yours can be sold. So there are certain conditions that need to be met, but it is not the case that HIPAA only protects your privacy. What it really does is sets a mechanism how to, on the one hand, protect your privacy, but on the other hand, also make it possible to sell it under certain conditions. And without your consent, I should say, this is not under your control. You cannot say, I want it or not. You have no say there. And the Supreme Court made sure of that already earlier when the Supreme Court was not as extreme as it is now. Already in 2011, the Supreme Court, for example, decided that uh, what the doctor uh, prescribes, this information can be sold unless the doctor opts out. But this information can be freely sold and of course it contains information about you, possibly. Now, coming back to the peer rate trackers, they of course uh, can access not just you know their, your, your uh, data about the peer rate, but also your, your name, your location, your email address, uh, your browsing history. This is really common, you should know that about most of the apps that you have on your cell phone. If you have a weather app on your cell phone, the purpose of the weather app is not really to tell you the weather. The purpose of the weather app is to access all the information that you have on the cell phone, which includes your, phone, your, your pictures, your email addresses, all your phone numbers, your videos, and transmit it to, to Facebook, for example. And you don't have to have a Facebook account for this happening. Uh, that doesn't really, really doesn't matter. The, these apps will do that anyway. <clears throat> this is really the purpose of most apps. Uh, that's really also the purpose of the whole operating system Android that Google developed that's running on most cellular phones. The reason why Google developed it is because it wants to get access to your private data. This is why it developed all this infrastructure and it's paying off well, very well for them. For example, if you have fitness trackers and, and other medical, um, other apps or Mac, uh, tools that are related to medicine, uh, most of these apps transmit your information uh, from your phone to anyone who wants to buy this information. So that means here are a few privacy survival guidelines that you should observe if you are in the position that you look for reproductive rights related things, but maybe some of these things are actually um, true in much more generality. Uh, do not use credit cards or customer loyalty cards whenever you buy some sensible product. This information, if you use a credit card or customer loyalty card, will be sold, will be available to anyone, meaning also law enforcement. And just don't use period tracking apps. Use an old school notebook offline, not on your phone. If it's on your phone again, this information can be accessed by another app that your weather app, it could access that information and transmit it, you know, to other companies. So just don't use peer tracking apps. Use an old phone, a notebook, offhand, offline. Um, even if it's encrypted, even encrypted uh, information can be subpoenaed. Don't have any sensitive conversations in front of uh, these virtual assistants. They will transmit all this information to uh, Google, Amazon, and so on. As a search engine, stop using Google. This is true for anyone, I would say, not just for people seeking abortions. Use, for example, DuckDuckGo. It works as good as Google and it's 
completely safe in terms of privacy. This is all they do. They really protect your privacy. So DuckDuckGo is the thing I would use on my computer and on my cell phone. Uh, as a web browser, uh, I would recommend to use maybe Firefox or Tor if you really uh, want to be strict, or DuckDuckGo also develop the browser. But do not use Google Chrome. That's the purpose of Google Chrome is, again, just to track every move you make. If you uh, want to use something like WhatsApp, uh, you're in the same situation as before. Instead, I would use something like Signal, which sends encrypted messages. But this only makes sense if it's uh, if the recipient also uses Signal. And that same thing is true with emails. There are encrypted email services like ProtonMail, but this really only helps if the recipient has the same uh, email program. If you use something like Gmail, you should know that uh, Google is, is uh, surveilling this email that you send and looking for keywords. So this is really an invitation for, for surveillance. And finally, if you want to look for more privacy tools, I, put, I posted two links here that have further information. Um, I'm aware that some of these things are really, really difficult, but you should know anything you do on your cell phone, unless you have a Linux phone, uh, is really an invitation for surveillance. So turn off as many things as you can, and at least use things like DuckDuckGo to avoid the most simple uh, in violations of their privacy. And I should say, some of these things here really work very well. Some of these things, like a proton mail, can be still subpoenaed by law enforcement. So they do help, but they're not 100% uh, safety guarantee. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. And to um, close this uh, part of our session with remarks, I want to invite um, Jessica. Pinky, P Pinkney Hill to um, give us some, like you've been listening to all of our, our researchers, you've been looking at some of the exchanges on the chat. Um, as an organization working directly to support um, those seeking reproductive health care, what are the most urgent research needs of, of an organization like AXIS? And how can researchers engage, engage with you and maybe with um, other organizations and community, um, other organizations and, and community health care providers and, and supporters. Great, thank you so much. Uh, as was mentioned, my name is Jessica Pinkney Hill. I use she and her pronouns and I'm the executive director at Access Reproductive Justice. Um, I hope that many of you are already familiar with our work, but I did just wanna start with a brief overview of um, who Access RJ is and the role that we are playing uh, here in the abortion access landscape. Um, access Reproductive Justice is California's only statewide abortion fund. Uh, and that means that we essentially help uh, abortion patients pay for um, their abortions, medication and surgical. Um, and we also uh, are a practical support organization, which means that we support folks uh, with travel, lodging, transportation, uh, childcare, food, lost wages, anything that folks need uh, to be able to make their abortion a reality. Uh, our primary audiences are uh, Californians seeking care here in the state, as well as folks outside of California who are coming here to California to seek care. Uh, and on a few occasions, uh, folks in California who do have to leave the state to access care, usually because they are um, later in pregnancy. And Access Reproductive Justice, we were founded in 1993 by clinic escorts who really saw that um, there was a need beyond just getting folks safely into the clinic, that many people were trying to navigate uh, additional barriers, whether it be getting from their home to the clinic or if they had to travel two or three or four hours across uh, part of the state to access their nearest clinic. As we know now today, about 40% of California counties have no abortion providers or clinics. Um, so that was the impetus for our organization. And I think 
Uh, I always like to share that we have been in existence for just coming up on 30 years now because folks always think of California as a safe haven for abortion access and a very progressive uh, forward thinking state when it comes to reproductive health rights and justice. Uh, and yet there are many barriers that exist even here in the state for Californians. Uh, and of course, since the SCOTUS decision, uh, last month, we know that those barriers are increasing significantly uh, for folks outside of California, mostly in hostile states. But that, of course, impacts um, what we're seeing here in California as well. Um, and so to the question that has been asked, I think, you know, there, there are um, some gaps in research that I think from a reproductive justice uh, framework sense, as well as uh, from a community engagement sense, uh, could, could be filled. I think this is a, a really tricky space uh, for reproductive justice organizations, for abortion funding organizations, because we are very much rooted in our values around bodily autonomy. Uh, and of course, as we've been discussing this morning, folks, safety and security. Uh, and so we're always trying to find a balance between what data and information is really necessary to help improve abortion access while still really respecting the, the individuals um, who are accessing abortion care, attempting to access abortion care, um, who may or may not want to potentially become a data point. Um, but I will note that uh, we, we do rely heavily on uh, research and data to inform how we do our work um, and ensuring that we're providing the highest quality support to our, to our caller base um, and to the broader community of folks who are trying to access abortion. Um, I think one place I would note, um, as we were anticipating the Supreme Court decision, uh, we were getting a lot of questions around how many folks we thought we would uh, be receiving here in California. And of course, there's not really any way to predict that. Um, there, there are, we have data, of course, and information around, you know, the average number of abortions performed in each state across uh, the, a year, a decade, et cetera. Um, but I think there has been a lot of uh, research and data gathered around travel patterns, um, but I think that there's some interesting research that could still be done in that regard. Uh, for example, the Guttmacher Institute uh, had released their um, their data naming that there would be a 3,000, up to a 3,000% increase in the number of people of reproductive age whose nearest clinic would become a clinic in California. And we know particularly uh, that the media really jumped all over um, that information. And while that is a really helpful statistic and data point, um, it doesn't actually reflect what folks' true travel patterns may look like. We know that folks may travel um, much further than their neighboring state for a number of reasons, whether they can get an appointment or not, uh, whether they have a support person in a state somewhere across the country, uh, whether there's a cheaper flight, right? Like it might actually be cheaper to fly from Texas to California than it is to fly from Texas to Oklahoma. Um, and so I think there's some really interesting uh, research that could be done around um, folks' travel patterns in this moment uh, and what and what drives uh, decision making, whether it's long wait times or whether it's comfortability with one state over another. I think there's some interesting information. Um, that could be garnered there that could be really useful in this moment as quote unquote receiving states try to prepare for um, somewhat of what is still an unknown influx. Um, I think um, 
you know, as was highlighted earlier, the turnaway study is absolutely a resource that um, reproductive justice organizations and abortion funding groups are using regularly um, as a really strong argument for um, why people deserve to have access to abortion, really no questions asked. Um, so I, you know, I would love to think about other research that could be done kind of along the lines of the turnaway study, really thinking about um, the long-term outcomes, both for folks who um, were able to have abortions, as well as folks who were forced to carry pregnancies that they didn't desire. I think, unfortunately, in um, this post-row world that we are now living in, uh, the, the number of folks who will be forced to carry pregnancies that they did not desire to carry to term will um, drastically increase. Um, and so I think there is unfortunately an opportunity there to make an argument for, um, for uh, what po the post row reality is really um, looking like. And then the last thing I will say is I think, you know, as we continue to push policymakers here in the state and across the country um, and federally, wow. as we continue to destigmatize abortion um, and really make it part of, you know, mainstream conversation, I think uh, there continues to be a gap in terms of understanding that abortion is not just a women's issue. It is an issue that impacts us all in one way, shape, or form, that there are folks who do not identify as women who are capable of pregnancy and therefore abortion uh, or necess needing an abortion. Um, and so, you know, would really love to encourage researchers to continue uh, to focus energy around um, around that. I think so much of the data that and research that we turn to is often very uh, women-centric uh, and understandably, but would really love to be able to paint a more holistic picture of um, who the folks are that are having abortions. And, you know, as someone who operates a health line, uh, we know that there are gender uh, non-binary folks, uh, folks who may identify as um, men um, who are accessing abortion uh, on, a, on a daily basis. And um, I think so much of the work that needs to be done in destigmatizing abortion is, is understanding that it doesn't only affect women identifying people um, and therefore so many more of us have a stake in this work and in this advocacy. Um, so I would love to see and, and collaborate uh, with researchers to see what is possible, um, particularly in, in that regard. Um, so I will stop there, um, but I'm happy to, to discuss more in Q&A around the work that abortion funding and practical support organizations are doing and where there might be oppor opportunities for collaboration with, with researchers. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, so that ends the remarks se section, and um, I wanted to spend the rest of the time just allowing the audience to um, post their questions. I have some questions here that were submitted by uh, people during registration. So I'm just gonna invite our speakers to turn on their microphone and um, and camera so we can, I'm gonna also ask Sarah McCullough from the Feminist Research Institute if she doesn't mind joining us uh, here on the screen. Um, so one of the first questions I, I have here, we are a teaching institution, we're an education and research institution. So I received different versions of, of this question, which is um, how can you see researchers and teachers advance reproductive rights um, without inviting criticism or as politically biased advocates? So how do we encourage these conversations and debate in their classrooms and our research activity in our research labs um, while maintaining like th this like not being politically biased um, and, and offering a safe space for people to have these conversations. Maybe I'll ask Natalia to, to go first because I know she's worked in this space a little bit. Yeah, 
Um, so, uh, I teach a class on reproductive justice and I believe it is important. Every class is already in a way biased in a certain way. I don't think that we ask these questions when we teach about capitalism. Uh, we already have in a way our, our, our own perspective. I think it is about uh, well, classes in sociology teach about welfare. Uh, so for me, I think it is important. I have taught this class for over 20 years. And for me, the idea is I'm going to be teaching about these issues because it's about women's autonomy, equality, liberty, dignity. And for me, that is something that I'm not going to waver on. It's not that I'm going to convince anybody that that's the way you're going to have to think but I'm gonna tell them why uh, that is an important issue and needs to be considered. Uh, why that has been historically and what are the consequences that have been um, for different groups of women. And so um, they can choose to take the class or not. Um, so, and there are many classes that people can take. I'm not gonna try to convince anybody to think the way I do, but that's why we have a diversity of classes. But I believe that it is important that people understand that every class in a way have a perspective and it's not only certain classes that have a perspective. And so I think it is really, um, in that, in that question, uh, I think it is a little bit disingenuous to not to consider that other classes do not have a certain bias in the way they teach. We all do in what we consider important and in, in the readings we choose. I'll leave it at that. I, I know, um, okay, Mitch raised his hand first and then we'll go to Sarah. Thanks. I actually love this question because I think this is part of our problem. We live in a world where as people who are concerned about choice, we want everybody to have their, their feelings of comfort and everybody on both sides to be heard. Whereas those who are in the conservative movement who think that women are have no value other than being a carrier for a pregnancy are very dogmatic about their principles. This is wrong and we don't accept anything else. And the more that we continue to try to be these nice people, we're gonna to continue to have our population uh, in the wrong place. I'm tired of this. I've never been apologetic about saying we are, and I'm in the clinical side and in the, in the clinical research side, we provide all care for all women. I have no problem telling trainees that if you don't feel comfortable providing abortions, maybe you should not consider coming here. Those that do come and train with us, that doesn't mean they have to provide abortion services. We do have uh, residents and other trainees who say, I'm not comfortable with this, but they are required to learn about it because this is healthcare, right, period. And that we don't argue about. So I'm tired of the, well, let's make sure everybody sees both sides and I have to understand how you feel. You know what, I don't have to. That's how you feel and you keep it to yourself. When you're in our world where we provide all care to all women, this is how it is. You're going to learn about it. You can't opt out of it because abortion happens to be one of the most commonly provided uh, procedures to pregnant women. And if you're gonna learn medicine, you need to learn about this. You don't have to like it. You don't have to agree with it. You can choose not to provide it. Keep in mind that in clinical training, just I'm sure the same as in law school, we teach people about a broad array of uh, areas within their specialty, but when they leave, uh, their training, they don't provide all of that care. They are incapable of it. Some of it's subspecialty care. Some of it are even general things that they don't feel comfortable providing, but they need to know about it. And that's what we're responsible for. I think as a community, we have to stop apologizing for this, worrying about everybody else. And we need to stand up and fight just as hard as 
to be fair, the other side. Sarah. Um, I really, really appreciate the comments of the last two um, folks and, and we'll just kind of um, amplify some of what Natalia was saying is that generally what's seen as bias is that which doesn't adhere to status quo. Um, and the fact is that the status quo of much of our world um, is based in histories of white supremacy, colonialism, and in this case, patriarchy. And so um, when we talk about things being biased, um, what we're actually saying oftentimes is this is something that is challenging status quo and therefore challenging somehow white supremacy, colonialism, or patriarchy. And I think that is exactly what's happening here. And so um, when, so, so I don't think we should fear accusations of bias. I think we should actually lean into them as an opportunity to demonstrate that the, the, um, the bias, you could say, of, of discrimination and oppression that already exists with, within our status quo. And Mary, and then I think we'll move to another question after. Yeah, I mean, I just came from an institution where I wasn't really allowed to take that approach, I would say. I came from the Florida University system, so I was sort of forced to demonstrate neutrality. So um, for people who feel they have some kind of institutional or personal reason to do that, um, I think it's often effective to let people see the facts. Mitch's presentation was really powerful on this. So if I'm telling histories, for example, you know, of anti-abortion violence or misogyny, I don't, you know, intervene and say, look, everyone, this person is a misogynist. I just let them speak for themselves. I give people the facts. And often that's perceived as neutral. It's I'm not, it's not, but people perceive it that way. And I think that's sometimes a way, and obviously that that works better for historians, right? Methodologically, that's something I can do because of the discipline I write in and I can use that strategy in the classroom too, if I'm presenting certain kinds of topics. But um, I think sometimes people perceive as neutrality um, tone or, um, even rhetoric when it isn't there. So I think if you're finding yourself feeling uncomfortable because you're being perceived as biased, you don't have to change your normative commitments. You may change your tone or you may lean more heavily on facts rather than um, interpretation of said facts. Let students interpret facts that are obviously sometimes, there, there aren't a lot of good interpretations of certain things, right? So there's a story I like to tell. There's some of you may know a gentleman named Joe Scheidler who was involved in blockading abortion clinics and, and I'm probably in some violence against abortion providers. And I didn't, one of the first oral histories I ever did with was with him. And he interrupted me in the middle and said, you know, I want to talk about killing abortion doctors. I hadn't raised this question. And I said, okay, go ahead. And he said, well, you know what? It doesn't work because, you know, women and pregnant people just find another doctor. You know, it's just a waste of time. Now I can tell you that story and there's nothing else I need to say, right? I could then stop and say, Joe Scheidler is creepy. That's horrible, what a monster, whatever. But I think it's so powerful to just let him hang himself. So I think if you're in a scenario where people are pressuring you to be neutral, there are techniques you can use to let the truth speak for itself um, that may not get you into trouble. But I agree with everyone else. You shouldn't have to do that, but I think you will. You may find yourself in settings that are not as wonderful as the California University System or the state of California, where you feel you have to kind of perform neutrality, and that's a way to do it. Debbie had her hand up. Debbie, um, thank you, Mary. Another question or another topic that has come up a lot is around um, rights to confident confidentiality or data privacy, particularly when it comes to like how we handle our health data and our conversations with our healthcare providers. And we heard a lot um, in terms of like actively what we can do to protect our privacy from um, Professor Stromer. But I also wanted to hear from, from Lisa and Mary and also from Mitch in terms of, you know, what are the implications for some of us who might not be necessarily well versed about what happens to all the information that is collected when, when we go to see our health provider and, um, what should we be looking at? What conversations should we be having with our healthcare provider around our data privacy? Maybe start with Mitch. Well, again, here in California, we're in a different world. I think for my colleagues who work in Ohio, um, even in Indiana, where it's still legal, um, the, the main issues really are the, the these 
this scenario has created a barrier between patients and providers and even between people and their friends, right? Because you don't know who you can trust. And it will depend on the laws. There will be states where it's just illegal and it's a criminal act. And there will be states like Texas where they put a bounty on it and your neighbor can sue you for $10,000 for feeling personal grief over learning that you had an abortion, right? So the, um, the, fi and the financial cost, the criminal cost will all vary from state to state. Um, I, I think that um, I always encourage patients to be honest with their providers. And I think we're in a world, we've just created a world where uh, people can't be. I practiced in Pennsylvania for many years and it took time for people to be able to say, you know, those miscarriages I told you about, those were really abortions. So we know that patients will do this and we know that uh, we've now created a world where uh, providers are, um, uh, pay it's going to be hard for patients to feel comfortable with any provider, um, just not knowing uh, what, what to trust. And it's, it's sad. It will falter over into things like not trusting your provider if you're having a miscarriage. I'm worried to go into the hospital. I may be prosecuted for an abortion, even though I had a wanted pregnancy. Um, and we'll just have to wait and see how it all bears out. Lisa? Sure. Um, so I think, you know, um, Thomas Stromer's, sorry, I mispronounced your name, um, point sort of bears repeating and is that sort of you're thinking about the doctor patient relationship and you're thinking about HIPAA um, or the HIPAA privacy rules, but those are fairly limited, um, but they apply specifically to impo impose a duty to not disclose on what are called covered entities. So that covers sort of the sort of major actors in the medical healthcare system. That's substantially different than, for example, the information that Google collects or the information on the apps. Those aren't covered by HIPAA. Um, and so we have sort of a patchwork of rules and none of them are really complete. There are a couple of bills that have been proposed recently um, in Congress and who knows how far they'll get, but um, you know, going back to what Mitch said, a lot of it depends on sort of in what context you're speaking about. How was this information created? Was it created within the doctor-patient relationship? If so, then HIPAA provides you with some um, protection. If it's outside of the doctor-patient relationship, um, then HIPAA doesn't apply there. Um, you're hoping for protection maybe from a state law if you're in California that has its own privacy laws, but you might be in a state that doesn't have those kinds of privacy rules. And, and again, there are bypasses because all this information can and is being shared um, with brokers, um, data brokers, third parties, and it's accessible through those means as well. So we don't have the kind of protection in the United States um, that's necessary um, to protect people who are seeking abortion services or other reproductive health care um, that we need right now. Yeah, I mean, I would only add that because so many of these conservative states are now trying to regulate interstate travel, um, the idea that this is not a concern for doctors or people in California is not entirely right because we're starting to see states reach out and say, essentially, if you perform a legal abortion in California on someone who came from Alabama, we're going to try to prosecute you. And in reality, I don't know if that's going to work. They may try to prosecute that person who traveled. So when you're thinking in terms of digital privacy, um, you should be thinking not only about, about you or people in California, but about people who may be traveling to California, right? So if you're, you know, say like you're someone, I've seen this happening in the Bay Area, who's saying, I'm, I'm ready to host people who are traveling from out of state to have an abortion. Um, you don't want to put that on Facebook, right? You, so if you're thinking about how to present information about what you're going to do to help, or you're contributing to an abortion fund or whatever, anything like that that could implicate the privacy of somebody from traveling from out of state, you should kind of have the same conversation with you yourself that Thomas and Lisa and Mitch and others have outlined, right? To kind of protect that person's privacy because this is an area where we see states trying to regulate what other states are doing or at least trying to punish people for things they're doing outside of state lines. Thomas? Yeah, I should say that uh... The patient-doctor relationship is at least in a way symmetric. You share something, you know you will get something back. And the doctor doesn't secretly, while you're in their office, you know, go through your purse and look for you, for your know, things that are interesting to them. That's not happening, right? 
But with the tech companies, this is exactly what's happening. It's not symmetric. It's not clear what you get or what you have to pay for getting what you think you get. So this is completely non-symmetric. And I think it goes beyond abortion to stand up for our rights here in privacy. It affects so many aspects of our life. I mean, little, like simple, simple things. If you sit in your car, your cell phone runs out of battery, you recharge your phone in your car, in the plug in your car. If you have a newer car, then this car is designed to extract all information from your phone while you are recharging it. You don't know that usually, right? Uh, and these are things that are highly unfair and highly unsymmetric and standing up for our rights uh, is not just about abortion, it's about, you know, many other rights as well. I think maybe we have to do that. Thank you, Thomas. Um, we had a question submitted It's asking, um, what can UC Davis do to help move the language around abortion rights to human rights? Um, and as a follow-up, um, especially in the European Union, to protect human rights in the US. I don't know if that makes sense, but I guess it's a conversation around, you know, making this a broader discussion around just human rights in general. Who wants to? open up the conversation. Can I just make a comment on that? Um, this is Debbie. Um, I would say that when using a reproductive justice framework, you are using a human rights framework. And I think people need to become a lot more familiar with that. Um, one of the uh, weaknesses, huge weaknesses that we have here in the United States is that we're unable to use so many of the tools of human rights law uh, because we haven't ratified so many different kinds of treaties and agreements and such, and that activists in other parts of the world and instructors and, uh, you know, anyone doing their daily work can actually use because their governments have ratified certain important documents where we have not in the United States. So, again, just becoming a lot more familiar with what reproductive justice really entails is in some ways a channel toward using a human rights framework. And then I would say becoming familiar again with examples from around the world of how others have used the human rights lens in combination with a public health lens to really develop very powerful arguments. That's what happened in Mexico. And just going back to our presentation, the Mexican Supreme Court ruled that any limitation is unconstitutional based on human rights. That is phenomenal. Lisa has her hand up. Sure, I was just gonna say, I mean, this goes to the sort of first question that came up as well, is that part of what I think needs to happen is just to sort of normalize abortion, right? So whether or not the Supreme Court recognizes abortion as a right, we can still talk about it as a right, or more importantly, as um, Debbie just said, we talk about it in terms of reproductive justice, or as the question asked in terms of um, um, human rights. So how we talk about it in the classroom with each other, right, is important just sort of building that into our day-to-day -day culture, um, making it, using that framework regularly. Um, if we build it into the curriculum where it's appropriate, right? How we frame our research questions um, and um, how we do sort of how we contextualize the issues that we're asking, I think can also be used to normalize sort of full scope access to comprehensive care as a um, human right. Mary? I think um, what we've, what's, we've been hearing about um, international context, I think Natalia's work is really powerful on this and Debbie's too, is also really powerful. We've seen on the anti-abortion side, it's very effective when you, you, they have said for years, oh, you know, the US is an outlier, right? The rest of the world is so much less permissive around abortion than the United States. And if you look at the trend lines, almost all parts of the world, we've, we've focused um, to some degree with good reason on, on Mexico and um, South and Central America. We see the similar trends in, um, in Asia, um, South Korea and elsewhere. And so I think telling the story of, of international human rights to make clear that we're an outlier now, right? In denying access to reproductive rights and justice. That's a powerful point because I think 
that 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 idea that somehow we're we're not like pure countries, which is a problematic term anyway, but that resonates with people, I think, and we are an outlier. So looking to the rest of the world to the, it also, I would say, the reaction of the rest of the world to what's going on here um, can be a really powerful tool. And then I think the other thing that's that's clear, and I'm, I'm hoping I'm working with Lisa and some folks at the law school about this now, but the fact that Davis is part of the University of California, people are going to look to California for policy solutions going forward. They're going to look to California for policy solutions about how to deal with travel, about how to deal with the, I think the increasing volume of patients and dealing with how you get around some of these really unprecedented questions we haven't really been confronting since the 19th century and fugitive slave laws. And so I think it's also an opportunity for us across parts of the campus to, to be you know, hosting events, putting out content for people who are looking for those kinds of solutions. And I think people are already working toward that, but I think there's an appetite for it. And we've seen sharing of ideas happening organically on the policy side between progressive states already. Um, and I think universities can be purposeful in contributing to those conversations, right? I mean, it's it's already happening on a scholar by scholar basis, but I think we can be, you know, as a group sort of coming up with ideas and hosting events where we share those ideas or finding fora where we can share those ideas and writing um, for people who are going to be looking, I think, and desperately interested <laughs> in, in how to deal with some of the really impossibly complex uncertainties that are coming up in this world that the Supreme Court's put us in. I think Mitch had his hand up next and then Natalia. I'll, I'll try to be really brief. Um, the question was about what can we do at the University of California Davis. Um, this is really important for those of you who aren't aware. I mean, as soon as this happened uh, within the various UC campuses that had health systems, uh, there were immediate conversations with the chancellors and the chancellor's teams at each of these universities and that went right up to the university uh, California Office of the President. UCOP has come out very strongly with statements that it will support and work with the state um, on the numerous legislations or legislative bills that have been introduced to support uh, patients, to support providers, uh, including supporting patients from outside the state. Um, and the UCOP president has uh, been very outspoken about saying that the University of California system is going to be um to ensure that this will be part of uh, what we do as a as a um as a university system at uc davis the chancellor's office has come out equally strong at some of the other university uh health systems in the state this is already translated into hundreds of thousands of dollars of funding for specific programs um we uh, at uc davis um on the health side we're aware of this and will continue to work this way, but for those of you that work in other parts of the system, or maybe even within UC Health, but aren't aware of this, take advantage of, uh, of the situation, not take advantage, but uh, work with the situation. If you um, in the law school or anybody else, write to the chancellor um, of, your law, of your law school, work right to UCOP, tell them that, uh, reinforce with them how important this is, and maybe as they look at providing additional funding in different areas, they may not realize that there are other parts other than UC Health that need funding, that need this uh, support for the work that you do, um, that all of you do in research and in other aspects of your um, appointments within the university. So take advantage of that and work with the uh, UCOP and the chancellors. Yeah, I, I was just going to say that. Uh, First, I would say educators like UC Davis can do is we need to start educating more our students, our staff, our faculty about these issues. I think it is really important that we you know, create more curriculum on these issues of reproductive justice and that they are, that we are, the, are at the forefront, not only at UC Davis, but at all of the UCs on issues of reproductive justice. That is really important. As a faculty member, I, I always tell my students, where is the vending machine that has plan B? That should be one of the first things that we do. That is really important. They need to know that. Do all the staff, do all the faculty know about all of their rights because we should be the first educators of, of our students, of the people around us. That is really important. Uh, we should be 
escorts. We should be supporters of access, reproductive justice. We should be the ones now organizing to be collectively organizing to be supporters, not only of people in California, but of people who need to end unwanted pregnancies in other states. How can we organize? That should be something that we should be doing and not, not have to um, ask people, feminists in Mexico to risk their lives to do that. So how do we do that? UC Davis should be organizing that. Um, I think that that is really important. Um, obviously that we should not be recording this, but uh, maybe we can delete that. Uh, uh, but you know that we should have like books and be reading and discussing things about how could we be at the forefront of that. And so I think that uh, that is something that we should be doing because this is about women's and people's lives. Because if they don't do it safely, guess what? We're going to have people who will die. And so I think that that is something that we should say is unacceptable. We're not going to do it. We're not, we don't want to have that happen. And so what are we going to be doing? Uh, and so that for me is really important. Um, so yeah, I want to leave it at that. Mary has her hand up and then I know Anna Ward is in the audience and I might call on her after to just talk to us maybe a little bit of what she's aware in terms of activities and organizing at the office of the president level. Oh, you're muted, Mary. Yeah, I was just going to reinforce what Natalia is saying is and to also reinforce that we're in a position of privilege to be able to have these kinds of conversations. One of the other things we see, I mean, if you all want to hear horror stories and feel really glad that you work at the University of California Davis, we can do a separate event where I tell you about ideological diversity surveys and a variety of things that I had to go through, um, basically policing my scholarship. And I'm not even, I'm a historian, so I'm not even probably that offensive to Republicans compared to some people. And so I think that also means that if we're at an institution like the University of California that allows us to speak out, we have a responsibility to speak out because they're going to be colleagues across a variety of other institutions who don't have that privilege, right? And I, I know many of them, right? I've been on faculties with many of them. So I think that it's important to think about this not only as an opportunity, but as a responsibility, because they're going to be colleagues across other institutions who would like to do more, but are not able to without risking their professional security. So I'm just going to wait to hear back from Anna to see if she's okay with like talking to us a little bit. But we, we only have a few minutes left. Um, another question that comes up um, often is the what can I do? Where should I be investing my time, my energy, my money, my intellectual capacity? And so I'm gonna, I want to ask each one of our panelists to just take a couple of minutes to answer that question. And if, if there's one thing you can do, what would it be? But I also want you to like complement that by telling me like, what is your biggest concern at this point? Like, what is the one thing that you're like, okay, this is the top thing we need, I, you know, me and my field I need to be thinking about, and here's the one thing I can do. So can we start maybe with, um, with Mitch? Well, everybody, it lives in a different um, environment. And I just think the one thing you can do is realize that this is an important part of the world we live in. It, to be fair, gun violence is right now too. And these are all things that we uh, should be spending our time talking about with our friends, with our colleagues, keeping in the forefront of our mind, uh, realizing that whenever an opportunity arises, the more that we can keep it in the forefront, the more we'll have a presence of mind to try to act on it. I, um, I can't tell you where to donate, uh, should you donate, um, what you should do with your Saturdays, but if you keep it in the forefront and do whatever each individual can do and within the realm of what they're capable of, then uh, we, as a group, as a team, we can all move things forward. From If you do want to donate money, um, obviously Access is a great organization within California. Um, and if you asked me yesterday, I might give you a different answer than today. Today's answer is give to the Indiana Abortion Fund, right, after uh, um, what happened um, over the last few days. But any, if you are um, interested in donating, there is no shortage of services that are out there, organizations that are out there to, to help people 
um, with true intentions to help people. But uh, just keep it in the forefront of your minds. Uh, how about Lisa? Let's go with Lisa next. Actually, I was going to defer to Jessica. Go ahead. I hear from somebody on the ground. Thank you. Um, yes, I would agree. Uh, Access Reproductive Justice here in California is your statewide abortion fund. Uh, and we always appreciate donations. Uh, of course, we've also uh, been receiving a lot of interest in uh, from folks who want to volunteer. We've had over 4,000 uh, individuals sign up uh, with our volunteer interest form. Uh, and we have one person who manages our volunteers uh, and goes through uh, those forms. We're a grassroots organization. So anyone who's going to volunteer with our organization, we want to build a personal relationship with. So we're actually shutting down our volunteer interest form for the time being. Um, so as much as I would normally encourage folks to volunteer locally, um, no matter where you are, abortion funds are really being inundated right now. Um, and so if you if there are volunteer opportunities wherever you may be, I would just encourage patience and grace with, uh, with uh, organizations that are um, very minimally staffed. For example, Access RJ, we have six uh, staff total. Um, you can find your local abortion though, abortion fund though, if you go to nnaf.org uh, and you can put your zip code in or your state in and find uh, whatever local abortion fund. Strongly agree with the recommendations around uh, Indiana right now. Um, of course, there are over 90 abortion funds, many states having more than one. So that's a great place to direct your energy. Uh, and I think as uh, a group of folks who are highly uh, educated and invested in this conversation, uh, the work that can be done in community amongst family members uh, in your networks uh, to just shine a light on the various issues around abortion access is incredibly important work right now. Um, and I know it, it, people are looking for a way to be really plugged in and engaged, and that doesn't always feel like it, but it really does go quite the distance. So I really appreciate the conversation around um, what colleagues, what you can do with colleagues uh, to push this um, issue and raise awareness either on your campuses or um, in your own personal networks. Thank you, Jessica. I'm, I'm going to go to Thomas next because I know he has a tight schedule this, this morning. So my, my recommendation is stand up for your privacy whenever you can. Take the time to opt out when you can. Often it's a little bit tricky, but do that. It really is worth doing it. We need to enforce our rights. We cannot give in to the feeling there's nothing we can do. We can do a lot. We just need to do it. And then sometimes it's inconvenient. Uh, but we need to do that. Easy things, switch to DuckDuckGo instead of Google or something everyone can do, but it's far not enough. It's just the first step, step for, for your privacy. You help women looking for abortions uh, in that way as well. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, Natalia? Yeah, so I wrote down several things. I think the first, vote. Make sure that you vote down the list for people who are for women, for uh, migrant rights, for uh, all of the things that are important and make sure you go down the list. Now there's midterm elections, but so for those of you who can vote, vote and vote in, with informed, uh, inform, in an informed way. Also, let's talk about reproductive justice. Let's talk about abortion. Let's make it visible. So I always have in my office, a lot of reproductive justice posters I have in my uh, refrigerator so that people know that I'm a safe person for who that they can talk about these issues. And I think it is important that we destigmatize abortion and reproductive justice. Also, if you can do things, be an escort, go and make sure that you do things and be volunteer also being conscientious that 
uh, what Jessica mentioned that they're overwhelmed and things. But if you can do those kinds of things, they provide childcare for women because they need childcare. All those things are really important. So if you don't have money to donate, that's fine, but you can provide one or two hours of your time. Also, let's organize. There are things that we can do for women in other states. And so let's think strategically of what we can do. And let's do it when it's not being recorded. Also, donate to people, women and feminists who are organizing in Mexico. La Libres, for example, they also need donations. who are doing great things for women here in the U.S. Thank you. I'm going to go to Lisa next. I actually typed a comment in the um, <laughs> um, in the chat, so um, people can take a look at that. But I would also just sort of building on what Jessica said earlier. We have, you know, if you're just thinking as a Californian, what can we do to expand access in California? Um, part one of the issues, and other people here know that I've worked on this, is that um, one out of six to one out of seven hospital beds is in a Catholic hospital. Um, or a religious hospital that does not provide comprehensive care, including in the emergency room. Um, and that's in part because we have really broad federal exemptions for providers, and that includes institutional providers, um, to, who can then refuse to provide um, necessary services based on religious or moral beliefs that they claim. Um, and so as an employee of the University of California, you can demand that the networks that we have within our um, healthcare programs include providers who provide full scope healthcare um, so that your only option isn't the, isn't the Catholic hospital that's nearest to the UC where you work. So I'll just mention that. We're the fourth largest employer in the state of California. So as a group of employees, we have that, we have that power. Thank you, Lisa. Mary? I mean, I think what, what worries me, again, is um, essentially that I think when we've thought of reproductive justice issues, a lot of, I think, organizers were the first to sound the alarm that just access to the vote is a major issue. Um, I think it's pretty clear in a variety of conservative states that polling would indicate that people don't want abortion bans, right? That's pretty clear in Kansas. It's pretty clear in Oklahoma. And yet, here we are, right? And so I think if you're thinking about areas that need attention, I would say when you think about reproductive justice issues, think about access to the ballot as a reproductive justice issue, because it is. It's not so much the case that most people don't want access to abortion, they do. It's just no one cares what they want in a lot of these states. So problems involving you know, gerrymandering, limiting access to the ballot, all, all of those are things that if you're passionate about this issue, you have to be passionate about too. And those are mistakes, honestly, that have been made in the past. Those issues were siloed. Um, and I think the other thing too, and, and Natalia already emphasized this point, is that as much as Lisa's right that things are not perfect in California, I think it's sometimes easy for people who are lucky enough to be in places like California to forget about how awful things are in places like Indiana or Ohio. And so I think when you're thinking about um, you know, using, you know, time to campaign for candidates, consider doing that in local prosecutors' races or state legislative races and contested states. Um, and donating, as we mentioned, to abortion funds is like access to reproductive justice is amazing, but donating to abortion funds in places that are in the middle of, you know, a nightmare, right? Because I think sometimes it's uh, when, when it doesn't affect you, right? This is the sort of famous Holocaust concern. It's easy to forget how much harm other people are facing. So I think um, knowing that you can or make a difference in organizing from California for people outside of California, including in parts of the United States where things are really bleak um, is important too. And then I just want to close by giving Sarah a chance to, to make some remarks because she has extensive experience engaging with community groups and the Feminist Research Institute. It's an absolutely outstanding resource um, for all of our faculty and researchers interested in this topic at UC Davis. Um, thanks. I don't really feel like I can add much to what others have said, um, other than to, you know, I think it's vitally important to continue to stay in touch with those communities that are most impacted because they're really going to know what's what's needed, as many have said. Um, and I also just added a note in the chat, you know, how important it is for us to hold um, that how these uh, this ban is making life even more difficult and unlivable for those that are already 
be subject to um, oppression and discrimination in their everyday life. And I particularly want to highlight um, those that are incarcerated and, and in detention um, who are truly trapped. And um, and that this, you know, this is um, this is another group of people that we we can't forget as we're having these rep that these conversations about reproductive health and rights and um yeah and this is just an issue that that touches touches everything so thank you and i i'm sorry debbie if you would like to give us a perspective from a non-uc davis uh researcher please thank you uh, i mean i'm here in south carolina and it is bad <laughs> just to say i i mean it's it's horrible here quite honestly. So one of the things that I think is incredibly important is learning about what's going on globally and what lessons can we bring back to, to the United States and really translating the data that we have, the lessons that we have learned over time um, in ways that policymakers and legislators can understand. Do they care? That's another issue. But can they understand it? I think that sort of awareness raising is incredibly important. And then lastly, we're all in privileged, privileged positions of being located at universities and having students, young people, um, you know, that we are engaging with every single day. And so getting them involved and really guiding them in ways where they know how to get involved in terms of their own do a paper, you know, on abortion, just an exam, starting with an examination of the issues. And when I have done that over the last 15 years of being here, students' eyes are constantly open. They have no idea. So I think that that's just so important. Thank you for that time. I, I just want to thank again to all of our panelists. We went a little bit over 12. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we could spend the whole day and we could have a dozen more people on this panel to have this conversation. We will share the, the recording with everyone who registered. But if if you, if the panelists or every, anyone in the audience knows about other events, seminars or resources on our campus that we should be sharing with the group at large, please feel free to email me and we'll make sure to condense all that and, and send it out to everyone. Again, thank you very much. This is, it was an unusually long panel. I learned a lot today and I really appreciate you sharing your knowledge, your expertise, your experiences. Um, and hopefully we can have a different conversation in a couple of years. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll see you in September. We have a, another forum looking at the 17 year gap between research and practice. We have another outstanding panel from the UC Health CTSC group. So um, keep your eyes out for that announcement. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you very much, everyone.